True to its name, Universal Studios has always been a leader when it comes to introducing audiences to strange new worlds and alien life forms. As early as 1931, even Frankenstein reflected the public's interest in extraterrestrial phenomena like cosmic rays. I have discovered the great ray that first brought life into the world. Universal's Flash Gordon serials were among the first American films to depict alien life, although Ming the Merciless amounted to little more than Dr. Fu Manchu in orbit. The Invisible Ray told the story of a scientist whose fascination with another galaxy was his downfall. This is the nebula in Andromeda. A ray from this nebula will be caught here and electrically transferred to the projector in my laboratory. From Andromeda? Three quarters of a million light years distant. No real aliens yet, but we're getting closer. But it was not until the dawn of the atomic age that filmmakers began giving serious thought to the possibility of extraterrestrial life and its cinematic implications. Well, I think there were actually a number of things that came together in the 1950s. In 1945, you had the, the first use of atomic weapons and the first public knowledge that such weapons existed. And all of the wartime technology that came into play, some of it very promising, some of it rather dire in its implications, uh, particularly the atomic bomb. For many people, the new technology of destruction was so incomprehensibly frightening that it may as well have come from outer space. They're going to hit us. They're going to hit us. There's a lot of things bothering people. They need a lot of escapism, and I think these movies really provided that, plus used those very elements of the Red Scare and the atom bomb and everything else to make this work. These were like displaced films about the fears of the Cold War, the fear of outsiders. How different were they? Did they really want to destroy us? And that's really what It Came From Outer Space is about. I'm sorry. We did not want to use violence. Now there's no other way. The science fiction films echo the paranoia of the Cold War. We were beginning to find that there, that there were communists who were sharing significant secrets and so forth. This paranoia was perfectly reasonable, um, and it, it infiltrated into the worlds of entertainment. In the post-war era, fears of invasion in popular culture seemed to center on one special image, a flying saucer. Well, the flying saucer scare actually started in, in like 1947 is when people first started seeing these saucers floating around or whatever. And that just seemed to be a natural thing for Hollywood to jump right on in the 50s because people were seeing more of these things, more reports were being made, no proof of them, of course, and that was even better for the studios because they could come up with these kind of things and, hey, who could say they're wrong? As the world contemplated its technological future, science fiction became an important literary form Ray Bradbury was among its most celebrated practitioners. He was and is a brilliantly poetic writer. It wasn't the science that powered his stories, it was the characters. So he was uh, really quite a unique presence. Bradbury also had an enormous influence on science fiction films. When Universal decided to get on the science fiction bandwagon, they naturally consulted Ray Bradbury. But his understated, character-driven approach wasn't necessarily what Hollywood had in mind. The original script didn't have a monster in it at all. It was just sort of a psychological drama. I mean, you never actually got to see it. For it came from outer space. Both Bradbury and director Jack Arnold favored an alien that was never directly shown, although the audience would get a chance to see through the alien's point of view. In fact, that's exactly how the film was shot. It Came From Outer Space chronicles the dilemma of an amateur astronomer, John Putnam, who witnesses the apparent impact of a huge meteor in the Arizona desert. When he investigates the smoking crater, he discovers something completely unexpected. A huge, sphere-shaped craft, evidently of extraterrestrial origin. But our hero's only evidence is buried as the crater collapses. But I tell you, I saw a ship. 
You saw something that looked like a ship. You can't prove it, John. I can prove it if I can get you to help me dig it out of there. Meanwhile, Putnam becomes a laughingstock. The aliens are real, but they're not quite the invading presence that Cold War audiences might have expected. The aliens in It Came From Outer Space don't want to be here. They didn't come to meet us. They didn't come to tell us anything. They got here by accident. It's a, their, their car broke down. We are repairing our ship to leave your world. We need your help. The creatures, the xenomorphs in It Came From Outer Space, didn't intentionally come to the Earth. They are not hostile. They're simply hideously ugly by human standards. We are not yet ready to meet in friendship. Why not? Because you would be horrified at the sight of us. It's one of the important images that, that I think emerges from it came from outer space is the establishment of the scientist slash hero through the, the person of Richard Carlson. Yeah, Richard Carlson became their staple uh, good guy, I guess you'd call it, hero in, in a lot of these movies. You know, the creature that came from outer space. I mean, he just kind of showed up in these films all the time, but he was very good at it. Handsome, erudite, dark-haired, ruggedly uh, good-looking, kind of outsider. See, this town doesn't understand you, poking around out here in the desert, squinting up at the stars, and now you come up with this story. This town. The reason I came out here to the desert was to try and get away from that kind of thinking. And Carlson, of course, would reprise his scientist role in Creature from the Black Lagoon. And Universal would use similar actors, uh, well, John Agar for uh, uh, Revenge of the Creature and Tarantula, both uh, Jack Arnold movies, Rex Reason in, in The Silent Earth. But really, um, it came from outer space, establishes that archetype. Bradbury's story, adapted by screenwriter Harry Essex, was a thoughtful distillation of themes already familiar to the readers of literary science fiction. Could you kill me too? So this is the end, the grand total of all our dreams. I came here to help you, not to kill. The idea of aliens taking over human beings had been in the literature of science fiction decades before that. Although there are probably earlier stories, John Campbell's Who Goes There deals with an alien that's capable of changing its appearance to look like anyone, which is also a theme that exists in It Came From Outer Space. Don't be afraid. Here you had creatures who could look like human beings, and that would later influence Don Siegel's Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the 1955 film. But the aliens in It Came From Outer Space were far more considerate than your average pod people. It is within our power to transform ourselves to look like you. It Came From Outer Space is different from other 50s science fiction films in that it, it does not go to one extreme or the other extreme. So you get that paranoia, that sense that, the, that my neighbor may have looked like my neighbor, but he isn't the same person anymore. Uh, that sense of paranoia is very much in this film, but it doesn't pervade it. Incidentally, George is played by Russell Johnson, more recently known for his role as the professor on TV's Gilligan's Island. There are these curious tip-offs that we're not looking at the real character, the real human characters who are looking at their surrogates, with George, the, uh, the telephone lineman, looking directly into the sun without even flinching. Yes, the sun. Beautiful. Unusual for Hollywood, the Finnish film maintained much of Ray Bradbury's literate and evocative dialogue. It's alive. And yet it looks so dead out there. Oh, no, it's alive and waiting for you. Ready to kill you if you go too far. The sun will get you, the cold at night. A thousand ways the desert can kill. A lot of the poetic language of It Came From Outer Space is clearly, uh, clearly Bradbury's. Uh, think of that great scene uh, where Joe Sawyer is, is up at the top of the telephone pole and he's waxing poetic about the sounds of the desert and the, uh, and the lakes that aren't there and so forth. All that sand out there with the rivers, lakes that aren't real at all. And sometimes you think that the wind gets in the wires and hums and listens and talks. Pure Bradbury. 
That whole idea about life pulsing in the, in the telephone wires is, sounds very Bradbury to me. And that permeates the film because when somebody's car is driving along the road, it is followed in a helicopter shot. But the helicopter is positioned so that the telephone wires are in the foreground, as if the telephone wires are watching the car, as if the telephone wires contain the, the uh, intelligence of the aliens. The two old miners who are talking about how the mine is getting uh, old. That's just this poor old tunnel. Needs more propping up, like a man gets old. This is the kind of peripheral, poetic, human detail that you're not usually going to find in this kind of script. It came from outer space, completed shooting at a final cost of $750,000. At the last minute, Universal decided that an unseen alien might backfire at the box office. After all, the picture had been shot in 3D, a format strongly associated with visual thrills and chills. And then they saw it and said, wait a minute, this is 3D. We have to have something coming out of the people. We have to have a monster. So they actually created this guy. So what would Universal's first alien visitor look like? Previous Hollywood extraterrestrials weren't much help. The man from Planet X was an anemic precursor of today's diminutive alien abductors. And the thing from another world looked an awful lot like Boris Karloff in Frankenstein. At the turn of the century, the pioneer French director, Georges Méliès, envisioned a species of otherworldly beings in A Trip to the Moon. The uh, moon is inhabited by creatures who live in the lunar interior and who are essentially insects. They also are diminutive and very humanoid. They're um, acrobats wearing tights and grotesque papier-mâché heads. Universal's first attempt at creating what the script described as a xenomorph was a two-eyed creature with an exposed brain. It was quickly discarded, but later inspired the Metaluna mutants in this island Earth. The precise inspiration for the creature finally used in the film is still shrouded in mystery. Well, we're not sure how it was fabricated in those days because there really are no photos or even paperwork on this thing because I think it was sort of a, a, an afterthought. Well, it is a large cranium alien with a single eye with a kind of diaphanous mane of hair. But this is like, you know, polyethylene bags and stuff, and I'm sure they used very much the same thing. I know they used a lot of angel hair. I know that stuff they used to use on Christmas trees and things like that. And they used glitter. They had glitter thrown into it, because there's scenes where you see it, the glitter stuff on the floor and all that. They did a lot of glitter things. And of course, in uh, It Came From Outer Space, he's, he or it or she, or whatever, is seen in a veil of vapor, uh, some of which is extruded through the forehead, which I think was kind of a nice touch and it was very low-key lit. It was in a tunnel, in a mine shaft and stuff, so you never saw it. You're seeing it more here than you ever see it in the film. It's the first science fiction film to show alien perspective. We look through the lens of the Cyclops, through this gelatinous spherical mass, at the environment of the planet Earth. It's the first of the desert science fiction films. There would be later films like Jack Arnold's Tarantula, and films of that ilk, which use the environment, terrestrial environments, as if they were the bleak landscapes of other worlds. It Came From Outer Space was also Universal's first experiment in stereoscopic cinema. In 1953, the industry standard for 3D photography was a process called natural vision. And Universal, for a variety of reasons, mostly economical, uh, decided that rather than rent natural vision equipment, they would build their own camera rig. There were right and left eye images, separate, complete motion pictures, that were locked down to synchronized projectors. It Came From Outer Space has got to be one of the top uh, three or four 3D movies of all time. The photography, the story, um, the performances, the music, uh, everything works together to make it uh, a great film, even flat. I saw this movie at the Pantages Theater in Hollywood. They were set up for the, the two projection 3D at the time, which is still the best 3D. And uh, I remember seeing this film, and it opens up incredible, because the first thing you see is this spaceship crashing right into you. And it was one of the most dramatic uh, openings for any 3D film. Now, what's interesting about that, if you really look, you see the mirror that that actual thing was running into. 
beside the lens. You can actually see it. It's so fast, normally you don't see it. In the 3D, you didn't see it. You're too busy watching this thing coming at you and doing this with your head, you know. Several of the uh, early 3D films were gimmicked up uh, to a fault, really, where, uh, you know, everything that wasn't nailed down was thrown at the camera to uh, show off this, this system. And it might have been good for a shock effect uh, here and there, but uh, it, it was really kind of overkill. Jack Arnold really understood how 3D could be utilized to tell a story. Uh, and then, of course, he uh, had a brilliant idea to use a telescope uh, and kind of swing it out into the audience. It was done very uh, subtly, but it was very effective. It was a perfect 3D vehicle because you had so many things happening, so many eerie things and smoke and stuff that could almost come right out of the screen at you and stuff like that, and it was, it was wonderful. It was kind of... Uh vaporous look was, uh, was a, a curious fixture of 3D films. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that uh, only about 30% of the light uh, projected by the camera actually reached the viewer's eye because of the double polarization process. There's polarization at the projector and polarization through the lenses of the, uh, of the glasses that the viewer wore. And that kind of dark, ominous atmosphere was perfect, ideal for science fiction films. I know that um when they filmed the avalanche, uh, which is one of the best 3D effects because it really serves to put you in the action, they had the camera mounted under this huge plate that, uh, you know, so that obviously it wouldn't get hit with all these rocks. The 3D was extraordinary. I mean, there are scenes in It Came From Outer Space where there's enormous depth. The whole film is composed in three-dimensional space with distinct foreground elements, middle ground elements in which most of the action takes place, and then distant background elements. I've got to see you as you really are. Come out or I can't take the responsibility of protecting you. Very well then, you ask to see this. The depth of that mine shaft is virtually meaningless in a two-dimensional image, but in a three-dimensional image, it's extraordinary. Here you're looking at this deep cavernous space and this creature in the middle ground emerging out of darkness. So that depth is something of which you're being constantly reminded by the cinematographer, by the placement of objects within the frame and the movement of objects in the frame. Now this actually has arms, which you can't see when you see the movie flat at all. You can't tell that. But in the 3D version, these arms actually come out at you and you can actually see them that way. But uh, the interesting thing about this is you see he only has one eye, so he can't see 3D. Even though it's a 3D movie, this guy can never see his own movie. For modern filmgoers, it's hard to describe what it was like back in the 1950s to actually watch a 3D movie. There are subtle things in It Came From Outer Space that are completely lost in translation uh, in a two-dimensional image. About midway through the film, it's that scene where the sheriff is talking about 92 degrees. 92 degrees is when people really, more homicides are committed at 92 degrees than at any other temperature. His gun belt is hanging on a coat rack, which is in the foreground. And he just casually reaches over and pulls the gun out of the coat rack. Well, when you see the movie flat, it makes no impact whatsoever. When you see it in 3D, it's startling to see this hand come out and reach this gun. One of the uh, legends about production of It Came From Outer Space is uh, the studio had uh, all of the uh, uh, employees working on the production sign a, a, a oath of secrecy uh, that they wouldn't divulge any of uh, what were supposed to be the uh, you know shock elements of the story. There was an interview that Richard Carlson was doing at the time to promote the film, and uh, during a break in taping, uh, they asked him why was there so much secrecy around this production. And he said the truth was they were trying to beat House of Wax uh, as the first major 3D film to play theaters. The film was one of the first to utilize the kind of ethereal, electronically tinged musical score that would become synonymous with science fiction. I think universal sci-fi scores were uh, tremendously innovative and a lot of their scores were fabulous, the westerns, the adventures, but the science fiction films stand out. There's, there's a... Uh, innovation to them. It came from outer space employed an evocative composite score, including the work of Herman Stein, Henry Mancini, and Irving Gertz. It came from outer space was just an eye-opener and a wonderful challenge, and I loved every bit of it. It was great. 
Well, you know, you're working on a science fiction. It's, uh, when I say it's modern, contemporary, it's out of space, uh, it gives the composer uh, a lot of elbow room to write freely and unconfined. The opening scene was scored by Herman Stein. The, the music is very traditional and Americana, and there's a homey feel to it. So we don't really know the story that's ahead of us, but we're led to believe it's going to be just a, a nice, happy little home story where these people are going about their business. But as soon as the meteor comes, all of a sudden the music changes. There's a lot of uncertainty in the music. Ellen and John are sitting in the car and they see George and Frank, who have now been zombified, come into town. And it starts with a pluck on the harp. And it's not quite the harp pluck you would expect. And it's kind of just this pluck of alarm. And the music is very understated in there, but there's something George, very Frank. odd about it. And there's a scene where John confronts them in the alley and there's this repetitive motif da 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 that goes on under the dialogue and it's it's not the kind of music the composers would usually write this is a repeated phrase that goes on and on and it helps to accent the fact that they are kind of talking in a zombified way we don't want to hurt you you least of all we don't want to hurt anyone the score made effective use of an unusual but immediately recognizable instrument the theremin. The theremin was one of the first electronic instruments to be used in films. Miklos Roja used it in The Lost Weekend, he used it in Spellbound, and it kind of became a cliche in the 40s as being the instrument of psychotic disorders. So if you drank too much, if you beat your wife, if you did anything that wasn't considered normal, you had a theremin associated with you. Well. Obviously, what's good enough for anomalies of the human mind is good enough for anomalies of everyday life. So when anomalies from outer space and from black lagoons started to invade us, things like that, um, these strange instruments became associated with them. The theremin was simply a box, uh, electronically utilized and plugged into uh, uh, an outlet uh, with a long antenna and uh, the performer at the theremin would utilize his hands against the antenna. Imagine one bar here, a rod this way and a rod that way, and you kind of move your hands like that, and you create a vibrato of a ba 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 sound like that by moving it, which gives it kind of this velvety tone that it has. It's there a lot to show the point of view of the aliens. It's also used to show uh, the attacking sequences when they are about to glob the people, which is what is written on the music scores, cues like killing glob Ellen, globs give instructions. If you ever wanted to know what it's called when that amorphous thing surrounds them, they are being globbed. Encouraged by outstanding box office, Universal immediately asked Jack Arnold to do another 3D sci-fi thriller. This time, there was no question that the monster would be shown. Although Creature from the Black Lagoon didn't have an outer space theme, it was, once again, a story of cultures in collision. This time, the invaders were humans intruding on the creature's watery domain. Jack Arnold's films were often enriched by a subtle overlay of social consciousness. Film historian Paul Jensen interviewed the director in 1974. He came of age in the 1930s, the period of the Great Depression, and, and came of age in New York in the theater world where there was a tendency to be more socially aware. And he said you should try, if you can, to find the, the social concerns in the stories that you are filming. Jack Arnold was uncredited for his work redirecting the alien planet sequences in Universal science fiction spectacular This Island Earth, nominally directed by Joseph Newman. But without the success of Arnold's It Came From Outer Space and Creature From the Black Lagoon, the film might never have been made. Oh, 
ionization layer must be maintained until our relocation is effected. Relocation? To where? To your Earth. This island Earth tells the story of an alien civilization whose energy resources have been depleted by an atomic shield that protects it from enemy bombardment. Sounds a little like our own nuclear arms race, doesn't it? What you're observing may well be the beginning of the end for our world. The Zagon meteors are beginning to get through our ionized layer. As you can well imagine, such a screen requires the output of great amounts of atomic energy. And you're running out. That's why you were sent to Earth. Emissaries from the planet Metaluna recruit a pair of Earth scientists, played by Rex Reason and Faith Demurg, to find a solution for their predicament. Well, perhaps recruit is too polite a word. This is probably the first example of an alien abduction ever put on film. To withstand the rigors of the voyage to Metaluna, the scientists must have their molecular structure completely reconfigured. You okay? And you? Feel like a new toothbrush. Metaluna also has a slave class of insect-like mutants, as thoroughly explained in Jeff Morrow's breathless exposition. I'd hope to prepare you somewhat beforehand. This is a mutant. We've been breeding them here for ages to do menial work. Well, actually, they're similar to some of the insect life on your own planet. Larger, of course, with a higher degree of intelligence. This one has been given orders to guard this corridor as long as we're here. Unfortunately, the mutants stage a revolt at a most inopportune moment. Although the scientists are spared, the masters of Metaluna have met their match. Also released in 1955, Jack Arnold's Tarantula told a familiar cautionary tale about the dangers of runaway science and nuclear radiation. As a contract director, Jack Arnold helmed many other films for Universal, not all of them science fiction, but 50s sci-fi remains his enduring legacy. In Monster on the Campus, a scientist's personality is transformed not by an alien invader, but rather by the monstrous encroachment of the evolutionary past. In 1957, Jack Arnold created his masterpiece. The Incredible Shrinking Man. Based on a classic science fiction novel by Richard Matheson, The Incredible Shrinking Man dramatized the almost surreal dilemma of a man contaminated by a radioactive cloud. In the usual 50s formula, radiation induced gigantic growth, but here, exactly the opposite happens. As the shrinking man diminishes in size, a certain strain is placed on his marriage. Scott, don't. But it is. See how funny I am? The child that looks like a man. Go on, laugh, Louise. Be like everyone else. It's all right. Well, why can't you look at me? Look at me! Although the real atomic mutation is the shrinking man himself, it is the everyday world that becomes distorted and threatening. <laughs> Finally, as the shrinking man approaches the vanishing point, the universe itself is revealed to him. The unbelievably small and the unbelievably vast eventually meet like the closing of a gigantic circle. And I felt my body dwindling, melting, becoming nothing. All of this makes a man like me feel quite small and useless. But you've gone into uncharted places, too. Oh, my explorations have all been on this planet. They reach into space. Through Universal's classic films of science fiction and science fantasy, audiences confronted their own apprehensions about the coming space age. And perhaps each imaginative encounter with this strange new world brought us a little closer to understanding our own. Well, they've gone. For good job. No, just for now. 
it wasn't the right time for us to meet. But there'll be other nights, other stars for us to watch. They'll be back. Thank you.